is a talk that I originally gave um, almost 10 years ago in my hometown of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to an audience of Christians. Oh. And the slides were for an hour long talk, and I'm supposed to get this down to about three or minutes. So I'm going to do a little bit of improvising and blast through some of this. Uh, how many people here have heard of Richard Dawkins? How <laughs> <laughs> many people here have heard of Charles Darwin? How <laughs> many people here have heard of Robert Axelrod? That's what this talk is going to try to fix, because Robert Axelrod is the scientist who figured out the answer to this question. Why aren't all the atheists raping and pillaging? And he only did it in the 1980s. Um, yeah, okay, so this is a long-standing question. If you don't believe in God, where does your sense of morality come from? And this question has been asked by religious people. It's been asked has been asked by atheist Bertrand Russell in 1960, but I cannot see how to refute the arguments for the subjectivity of ethical values. And you know, he's a, he was a staunch an atheist as, as you'd ever hope to find. He said this in 1960, and the answer wasn't no. Uh, so um, to sort of set the stage in Tennessee, I pointed out that um, human morality with God, you're on kind of shaky ground because you have to do things like decide which God you're going to believe in and how you're going to interpret the scripture. Um, next. Uh, one more. Um, so, uh, scripture, you know, everybody agrees that scripture requires interpretation, even religious people. Uh, so, for example, here is, you know, uh, the Bible says, he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. So, should we uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a Christian who would really advocate uh, the death penalty for blasphemy. Well, if they're uh, right, I'd be dead about ten well, times well, already. Well, 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 uh, you know, you'd God, you have to be a pretty radical Christian to, to really, um, uh, to really buy into this. So, um, some would. Well, ne uh, next one. Um, here's a, 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 one of the ten commandments. This is the, uh, the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters beneath the earth. So which set of ten commandments? Hmm? Well, second set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the second set. Yeah, right. So, so is it is it are you violating a commandment if you take photographs? Well, actually, like it goes on to say, "Thou shalt not bow down to them." And <coughs> oh, by the way, you shall not bow down to them. But so it's open to interpretation. So, but the Muslims, by the way, they actually take this part seriously, way. and that's why you'll never see an image of, uh, of, of well, anything in a mosque. And uh, making a picture of, of the Prophet, um, the Uriah, for that moment. Oh, here's a good one. This is, this is actually my second favorite verse in the Bible. Christians freak out over this, because none of them know about this. This is Jeremiah 19.9. Uh, this is God talking, and I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one the flesh of his friends. So this is God threatening the Israelites that he will force them to engage in cannibalism as punishment for not obeying his word. Um, and I brought this up to a street preacher once because I asked him, so is cannibalism a sin? And he said, of course it is. I said, so where in the Bible does it say that cannibal? How do you know that it's a sin? Where in the Bible does it say that it's a sin? And oh, by the way, here we have God threatening that he's going to actually make people engage in cannibalism. So how can it possibly be a sin if it's something that God is going to make you do? Um, and of course, they get very queasy about this. And the reason they get very queasy about this is because they, like all of us, have this moral intuition. Somewhere deep in our brains, there's this wire that kind of tells us at a subconscious level, that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Um, and this moral intuition has some universal aspects that transcend all cultures. So for example, there's some universal evils like harming innocents and, and lying and stealing, and some universal virtues like, like justice and honesty and charity that transcend all human culture. They seem to be hardwired into the homo sapien genome somehow. So where does this moral intuition come from? There are two possibilities. The first is that it uh, came from God. And the Bible actually kind of supports this because there's this, and again, Christians often forget this, but God created us without the ability to tell good from evil. And in fact, he explicitly told Adam and Eve, do not eat the tree, you do, don't eat this fruit that will tell you how you can tell the difference between right and wrong. 
<laughs> but they did it anyway, and that's why we can tell the difference between right and wrong. I've always thought that was even crazy. But... <laughs> um, the second possibility is that it evolved. But the, the, the question is, how did it evolve? And in particular, how does charity and altruism evolve? Because evolution only cares, care, only optimizes for reproductive fitness. Um, I was, I was going to try to make this point with a demonstration, but I got too hungry and ordered myself a pizza. I was going to say, can, can, can anybody, you know, spot me a slice of pizza? And I'm fairly confident that somebody would offer me one. In fact, people do walk into the room and say, hey, who'd like some of my pizza? Which is really weird from an evolutionary point of view because you're, you're giving up some of your reproductive fitness by giving up some of your resources to a total stranger, right? You're better off taking that food home to feed your own family than to give it to a total stranger from a strictly evolutionary Darwinian, hardcore Darwinian point of view. Right? So where does the sense of charity come from? It would seem to violate the tenets of evolution. So this is the, the puzzle that Axelrod solved. And the way that he solved it was with this mathematical model called the Prisoner's Dilemma, that math turns people off. So we're not going to think about it as a mathematical model. We're going to think about it as a game. <laughs> and the game is played like this. There are two players. And uh, at every round, you have only two possible moves. And they're called cooperate and defect. And each player chooses their move and writes it down, places it face down on the table. So they commit to their move before the moves are revealed. And then the scoring goes like this. If both players cooperate, then each player gets three points. And if both players defect, then each player gets one point. But if one player defects and the other cooperates, so defect and cooperate, then the defecting player gets five points and the cooperating player gets zero. So this is, from, again, from a strictly Darwinian point of view, this is kind of where you want to be if you're, well, if you're player two. And if you're player one, you want to be down here, because this is how you win the game, is by defecting while your opponent cooperates. So that's the game. So there are a couple of things to note about this. Um, it's a simple model of social interaction. So in every, it, it's the same, it's a, a simple distillation of the kinds of interactions that we have with people every day. We can decide to be nice, or we can decide to screw people. And everybody every day is presented with opportunities to better their own personal situation by screwing somebody else. And most of the time, we don't do it. Uh, uh, it's, it's not a zero-sum game, because the total number of points that you can get, total the sum of the, it, it is not the case that in order to win, your opponent has to lose. Like, Playing chess. The only way to win a chess is for your opponent to lose. That's not the case in this game. But whatever your opponent chooses to do, you do better for yourself by defecting than cooperating. You always do better for yourself by defecting than cooperating. And because of that, the logical move on any given turn would seem to be to defect. And if both players think this way, then both players will defect, and both players will end up getting one point, one point, one point, one point. When, if they'd been cooperating, they would have done three times better for themselves by getting three points on every round. <clears throat> so, the answer to this dilemma is that you don't play just one round and walk away. You play multiple rounds. And, on, and when you play multiple rounds, things change a little bit. Uh, so defection is the best strategy for a single round, and if you know how many rounds you're going to be playing, if you know that ahead of time, then that still remains true. And the reason it remains true is because if you know when the game ends, then you know that on the last round your best move is to defect, because the last round it's just a one-shot game. And so you know that your opponent's going to defect on the last round, and because you know he's going to defect on the last round, if he's logical, then you know he's going to defect on the round before and the round but if you don't know in advance how many rounds you're going to be playing, then everything changes in very interesting ways. The part is, there is no one best strategy. Oh. Um, uh, let's skip over this and just go. Yeah, so what Axelrod did is he, uh, he, he organized a tournament 
of computer programs to play this game. Mm -hmm. So the, so oh, you're going to write it down. So a computer program that will output on every round cooperative effect and will get as input the move that your the opposing program played and see which program does the best. Um, next. So he got uh, 14 entries from five different academic disciplines. And he ran this round robin tournament on IBM PCs with cumulative scoring. And does anybody want to take a guess what the winner was? Who doesn't already know? What would you think? Would you think that the winner would be a really complicated, sophisticated program or a really simple one? Simple. Yeah. So it turns out the winning program was the simplest one. Well, so here are the, the results of testing this. Um, the winner was a program called Tit for Tat. And uh, what, it, what Tit for Tat does is it cooperates on the first move, and then on every subsequent move it just does whatever the opponent did the move before. That's it. <laughs> that was the winner of the tournament. Well, uh, hmm? so, so that means the opponent could have been gone the selfish route. And that one, and then they follow because they were one step ahead. Is that what you mean when they're say they they did their uh, right. the winner was right. tit for tat, and so they they cooperated on the front move, and then so they came out ahead on the front and first move, and then well, they just well, followed they, the other it, one the rest it, of the way. It depends on on which program tit for tat is played. So uh, if tit. They if, keep switching. If tit for tat is playing a program that, def that defects on the first move, then, then tit for tat will lose that first round, and it'll defect on the next round. And, um, and so what happens if you get, for example, two tit for tats playing each other, then they just cooperate forever. Uh, if you get a tit for tat uh, playing a defect always, then tit for tat will lose one round and then just going to into infinite defections. Um, okay. uh, so um, there were, so remember the scatter plot, there were a bunch of programs that did almost as well as tit for tat. Uh, and they all had something in common, which was that they were all nice, which was that none of, that they never initiated a defection, they were never the first to defect. Um, and none of the losing programs was nice. So here is some evidence, actual scientific evidence, that being nasty is not actually evolutionarily advantageous, even though intuitively it seems like in the short run it might be. Um, let's see this one. All kinds of interesting and complicated things. Oh, and another uh, interesting feature of winning programs was that they were forgiven. Uh, so if they were defected against, they would not. Re they would only retaliate uh, proportionately to to how many times uh, they were defected against. So a lot of features that are part of this universal uh, human moral intuition are reflected in these computer programs playing this game. Um, uh, so this was kind of interesting. So. Uh, he decided to hold a second tournament, and uh, this one got 62 entries from six different countries, and Tit for Tat won again. Uh, niceness won again. Of all the top 15 rules, all but one were nice. And at the bottom 15 rules, all but one were not nice. So uh, the results were um, see. Yeah, so the top rules are also easily provoked. So this, this idea, this uh, Jesus-like idea that you should always just forgive people and turn the other cheek, that doesn't turn out to be uh, a, uh, a feature of winning programs. And it's also not a feature of human moral intuition either. Because you'll hear people say things like, well, yeah, you should turn the other cheek, but you've only got two cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a limit to how much BS most people are willing to put up with. And so that, and, and here we see a reason for it. Um, next. Uh, okay, 
so all of these rules, all these programs were written by humans. Not uh, evolution uh, coming into play yet. So what he did for the third round was basically the same thing, but let the programs evolve. So the programs were now defined in terms of a lookup table, and the lookup table, the, the lookup tables were uh, put together in a way that they could mate and create little offspring programs. Mm -hmm. They were random because of random variation. Um, and uh, so he let this uh, simulated environment of, of computer programs run for, I forget exactly how long, um, how long you ran it, but uh, tit for tat, next slide. Um, all but nine of the, the initial population rules went extinct almost immediately. Uh, and of the three that, of the nine that survived, three went extinct later on. Um, and tit for tat emerged again as the winner. <coughs> uh, and um, so, and again, you, you would see features in the simulation that are exactly what you'd expect to see given what we see in nature. The rules that are too nice get eaten by, eaten by the other rules that just find them and take advantage of them. The rules that are too mean, they don't find any other rules to, to partner with in order to, do, to engage in mutual cooperation and get those three points. Uh, so they die out too. So next. Um, whoops, I skipped ahead. Um, right, next, I was, I was talking about this set of slides. It doesn't, it doesn't work. I skip forward. Actually, that's probably about it for a 10 minute talk. So I could go on and, and talk about I have a question. some of the stuff in, in, in gory detail, but I should probably get open up for questions and discussion at this point. My question is how does that play out, play out in real life? Uh, when you talk about people who have the opportunity to do well, do evil or don't, and do they come out ahead? And, uh, yeah. Uh, what is your uh, so, uh, so, so actually, I'll talk about selfish genes. Uh, this is um, how, how many people? How many people here have read Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene? Oh, okay, great. Um, this I could do a whole other talk about this, but I'll try to ad lib down to about five minutes. Um, this is a book every atheist should read because it's the book that explains why we are the way we are. I mean, Darwin kind of got the broad brushstrokes right, but Richard Dawkins is the one who figured out the details. And in particular, he's the one who figured out what it is that's actually reproducing and actually being selected. There's a lot of controversy about this um, for uh, the first hundred years of evolutionary theory. Is it individuals that are being selected against? Is it groups? Is it species? And it turns out that the right answer is that it's genes that are being selected for. That that what evolution optimizes is the reproductive fitness of genes. And in our case, and, and genes are just any kind of thing that contains information that can reproduce. <coughs> and up until computers were invented, that meant DNA. That was the only game in town. That was all there was in nature that could carry information to reproduce. But nowadays, we have, well, actually, I should say until human brains came along. Um, Means. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Dawkins, by the way, is the one who invented the term meme, and before it meant cute pictures of cats on the internet, it meant <laughs> an idea that lived in a human human brains and could reproduce itself by escaping through, for example, talking and implanting itself into another human brain. So it's a unit of culture, just like a gene is a unit of uh, genetics. That's right. So. so Dawkins original, if you go and read The Selfish Gene, it's the last chapter in the original edition of The Selfish Gene. He almost puts it in as an afterthought, sort of, oh, by the way, the stuff that's reproduces doesn't have to be DNA, it can be this other stuff too. And the original was written in the 1970s, so this was when computers were just <coughs> starting out. And of course, nowadays we all are, have first-hand experience with all this stuff, computer viruses and all these all this other ways for information to reproduce. So Dawkins defined the meme as a unit of culture, which I don't think is actually strictly correct. Well, but it's something that gets passed on between people. 
phenotype is the physical manifestation of a gene. So your body is the phenotype of your DNA. And a, 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 a bacterium is the phenotype of a bacteria genome, and a cat is the phenotype of a cat genome. Except that, so Dawkins wrote another book called The Extended Phenotype, where he argues that it's not just your body that's the phenotype of your genes, it's also all the things that your body does. So civilization is part of the phenotype of the human genome. Uh, this is why I could talk about this for an hour and why jumping around and ad living sometimes doesn't work so well. Um, Move to Q&A. Yeah. Uh, so. Ron, can, can, can we answer a question here about what is the basis for an atheist morality? Is yeah, it, so the basis for an atheist morality is this, this, this intuition that you have, this instinct that you have for what's right and wrong. So you have this gut feel that killing somebody just because you feel like it is wrong, right? Every, does anybody not? Based on instinct? It's based on instinct. And the way you got that instinct is that that instinct evolved. And the reason that, that instinct evolved is because if you don't have that kind of instinct, then when you go through life and have all these social interactions with other creatures, and they have payoff matrices that resemble the prisoner's dilemma, so that if you cooperate with somebody, you get a certain payoff. And if you defect and do something nasty to them, then you get a bigger payoff unless they fight back, in which case you both lose. That aren't instincts rather it, difficult to pin down for human beings? I mean, you can tell that uh, they are difficult to, has an instinct to fly south at a certain time. They are difficult to pin but down. For human beings, saying that we rely on instincts for our system of morality, to me, gives the same feeling as when a Christian says or a believer says, uh, well, this is what God gives down to us. I mean, you can't pin down either one, especially pinning down instincts and defining them when it comes to that, human beings is that, rather difficult. That's right. And, and I, as an atheist, <laughs> would rather have more of a logical construct for the basis of my morality yes. than that. So, so, you, so on top of this intuition, you can also layer reason. And there are some things where, there are some places where your intuition is not a very good guide. And my favorite example of that is uh, the question of sexual fidelity. Because males and females have different payoff matrices in this regard. Males do better if they sleep around, and females do better if they are monogamous. That's not quite true. In terms of reproductive fitness. It's, no, it's not. It's mostly true. It's, it's if the man thinks they're being monogamous, and they can go around and they can find a stable mate, and they can go around and find a stable female, and the environment for, in which they can raise a child, and he thinks the child is his, and then she can go shop around for the best genetic material on the side. That works yes. better. Let me be a little more precise about this. Men can have more of their offspring gestating at the same, simultaneously than women can. And because of that, the, the core biological impetus for reproductive fitness is different for men and women. Yes, um, and, but, but we have also now evolved higher cognitive functions and invented things like civilization. Um, and so we are more than just our, than just creatures of our, of our core biology now. And so we can now apply logic and reason and think about whether or not we really ought to act on the basis of some aspects of our core biological intuitions. Um, and this is a question that the atheist community wrestles with because there's quite a bit of misogyny in the atheist community um, and, uh, and, and quite a bit of honest disagreement about whether or not this is actually a problem. And Richard Dawkins is one of the most vociferous uh, proponents of the view that it's not a problem. And I 
personally disagree with him, but that's an interesting discussion to have. Yeah. So uh, first time here, thank you. Um, <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so as you're speaking, Iris, yes, Iris. As you're speaking, I'm thinking about the instinct being contextual, the culture, and your SEO, your social socioeconomic status, and and I'm thinking that maybe to most of us, hopefully in the room, we don't want to kill each other, but maybe down the street someone else thinks it's totally fine. And that has to do with, like you were saying, the logic of it, which is socially we are constrained by some rules because we're social creatures. And we have respect for rules and order. Right. And, and also we want to fit in wherever we live. And so in our society, and most of our society, hopefully we're not running around killing each other because it's not acceptable. And if we were to kill somebody, we would, we would be ostracized and we would lose our slice of things on the table. But if you're not... Well, it depends. Well, it looks if, like, exactly if, like that if you're, if you're a prison guard, or if you're a soldier, say, then not only can you kill people in a societally acceptable way, it's like you're actually encouraged to. That's yeah. Right. But uh, if you, if you I was thinking when you were saying that you know some places, some cultures are going to be like this, some cultures are going to be not like this. It's just like the tit for tat, where tit for tat, it, 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 tit for tat is nice in the sense that it starts out being generous. It's got a blank slate, but if people keep defecting around it and they keep screwing tit for tat over, all tit for tat is going to do is screw everybody over back. It's it's just a reaction. So if you take kind of translate that into a human world, if you grow up in a nice middle class society, or everybody's nice to you your tit for tat is going to be that, okay, someone was nice to me, now I'm going to be nice to them. Someone was nice to me, I'll be nice to them. I'll be nice to the next person. And if, if you have a long string of being nice to you, of course you're going to continue to be nice. If you grow up in the ghetto, and people continually are mean to you, you're going to be continually mean to other people. Right. So it, it totally yeah. fits you're your society. Not Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> here's, here's an interesting... No, I, also have, I also have a view at this yeah. from the corporate point of view. Corporations make a lot of money. How nice should they be to the underlings? And that's a big a problem for them. So I go back for a second to the selfish gene. And the, the central thesis of the selfish gene is that your DNA, your entire genome, all 23 or 46 or however many, however you count, chromosomes, what those really are is an agglomeration of a a bunch of little genomes that originally came together randomly in the primordial soup and came together to form little gene societies that could do better by getting together and cooperating with each other by doing things like building cell walls and then sticking multiple cells together to make multi-celled organisms. And basically by making larger and larger agglomerations of Things with boundaries around them that divide uh, the, 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 the thing that they consider them from the rest of the world that they consider food and enemies and whatever. And so even though we perceive ourselves to be single unified wholes, what we really are is something more akin to like an ant colony, except that our the parts of us happen to all be stuck together, whereas the parts of an ant colony are physically separated from each other. So a individual ants can't reproduce. It's only a colony as a whole that can reproduce. And so it's the, the right way to think about ants biologically is that the colony is the organism, not the individual ant. The individual ants are kind of like cells or organs. Well, you're more like an ant colony than you think. The only reason that you think that you're this unified whole is because you're all stuck together and you happen to have this brain that, that has this sense of self um, and from which you perceive the world. But that's a very strong bias. So individual humans can't reproduce either. It takes at least two. And in raw nature, two humans probably couldn't survive. There's actually a reality show about this right now. Have you heard about this, Naked and Afraid? 
Yeah. And they take two literally naked. And the viewers are afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, humans can't really survive on their own. It, 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 and so we've built civilization. We built this, you know, extra layers of, of cell wall to surround ourselves with and protect us from the outside world. And so we're kind of like an ant colony. You know, civilization is kind of like ant colonies. We're like individual ants in that respect. So the boundaries between where organisms stop and where, where, where you draw the lines around organisms is very hard to tell. And that's sort of the, the whole thesis behind the selfish change. I highly encourage people to read. Yeah. So I was, uh, had a book that I wanted to recommend, uh, speaking of in improving access for women in uh, atheism. There's a researcher named Patricia Churchland, who is a professor at UC San Diego. And she's written two books. One of them is called Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. Um, so her, she's a professor of the philosophy of religion. Uh, but she's not religious. She studies the psychology of religion and the philosophy of religion. She's brilliant. Her second book is called Touching a Nerve, the self as the brain as self. And she talks about this also. And so she's talked about the recent research that's been done in this field to study what it is in morality and how it happens in the brain. And one quick second point I wanted to make is that we're social animals and we have evolved from social animals that have been social for a long time. And to be social, you have to be moral if you don't have these moral drives of fairness, equity, empathy, reciprocity, um, forgiveness, and exclusion of those who violate the morality, then you don't have a society. So it's not like, you know, who tells us that murder is wrong? You just don't have a society if you don't have individuals who believe that murder is wrong. Yeah, well, murder is a pretty clear-cut case, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, polygamy saying, is a much more interesting saying, yeah, it's, one. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> that's a issue. So each society may have different rules about what is fair, what is proper sexuality, what is what is authorized killing, what's not authorized killing. Mm -hmm. But the drive towards doing what's right is is innate from a long, long, long time ago. And, and by the way, a, one of the core uh, causes for people being at loggerheads with each other is their choice about where they draw the lines between us and them. Uh, Huge. Yeah. So, and different people, there's a lot of variation among humans in this regard. And some people draw it around themselves with a very strong sense of individuality. Those people tend to be politically liberal. And then at the other extreme, you have people who draw strong lines around their family or their racial group or their religious group. Uh, and uh, downplay the role of the individual in favor of the, the group. Um, and both of these are equally valid in terms of core human intuitions. They're, they're, uh, they're natural variations of this moral intuition. But when you don't realize that these are natural variations, you tend to look at people who are unlike you, who fall someplace else on the spectrum, and view them as alien and scratch your head. How can somebody possibly believe that? You know, how can somebody possibly think that it's OK to make women cover their faces? Exactly. How can that possibly be right? <laughs> well, the way it can be right is if you, your moral intuition draws a line around an organism that's, that consists of a large number of individual humans and considers that the thing whose interests you are tasked with defending. Yeah. That's kind of my question is, at what point does your innate moral, do your innate moral leanings defer off to like a religion? Um, and when does that overtake your biological need to be a decent person? Because, you know, for instance, just recently, there was the um, the Saudi cleric, see a cleric who murdered his five year old daughter mm -hmm. because he didn't think she was a virgin anymore. Yeah, I mean it. it yeah, I mean it's just so you can't draw any conclusions from from anecdotes, yeah. right? It's because among 
on, on the scale of natural human variation, you get things like people who are just crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it's possible that he was just crazy. I'm telling young women it's not necessarily an anecdotal case. So, I mean, that, that's certainly a, a documented phenomenon. Yes. So I think her question is really. Right, is that, is that just because they have a natural variation in there? Because when you said, when we tend to draw this very small individualistic line, and those people tend to be liberal, I was surprised. I was thinking it was going to be the other way around. Because when I picture somebody who draws their line right around themselves, I picture libertarian. I don't picture liberal. I picture liberal as thinking about people who are not part of me, that I want to be sticking up for the people who, I mean, I'm... I'm white middle class, but I want to stick up with people who are not white and people who are not middle class. And, and I want to draw my lines big. I want to draw the lines around the entire world. And people who draw the lines just around their family, just around themselves, the smaller your lines, the more conservative you are. And, yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's a metaphor. It's not really very tight. So when we're talking here about this variation, it's like, the metaphor starts to kind of come apart where you say these kind of people, this is just natural variation. It's, it's more really it, how individualistic you are than how conservative you are. Right, because yeah, well, well, individualism well, can mean we can do but, whatever we want, we can get married to whoever we want, or it can mean we're not going to help people who need help who aren't related to us. So, you know, the, the, the individualistic versus communal, sometimes communal means conservative, sometimes communal means liberal. I probably shouldn't have used the word liberal. Yeah. Um, but, but as contrasted with the kind of, the, the, the mindset that leads people to say watch Fox News, I, I think has more to do with group identification than seeking out a fair and balanced source of information. <laughs> but that's just my personal opinion. Um, another book that would be really helpful to read is by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. And he looks at morality, um, and he says there are seven different um, uh, characteristics by which we judge what things are moral. And for example, what is fair and unfair is one of these. What is pure and what is disgusting is another of these. And he has the whole seven. And it turns out that conservatives tend to have more of these counters in their decision of what's moral. And people we identify as liberal tend to use less of these. So everybody uses fairness. But liberals kind of think of purity and disgusting as like, that's not a moral issue. And for more conservative people, it is. So that's another. Uh, person whose books might be of interest to read. Yeah. Regarding the uh, uh, lady that is covered the hair, since I came from this background, mm -hmm. I can tell you those are more political than rather than uh, religion. Uh, they want to emphasize themselves to the society. And plus, the, regarding your question that the guy is clearly five years old girl, 200 years ago, the Saudi Arabia, when you have ch a child as a um, girl, they bury them life because they were a female. So it, it's mostly the cultural and those kind of things is more political. And they are constantly fighting against the Western uh, culture. So just to emphasize themselves that, you know, and we are exist, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, but the, the point is that it's all ultimately a Darwinian process. At, at the end of the day, Darwin rules, and what's going to be left standing n years from now for some large value of n is not what is right or logical or rational or anything that any of the values that the people in this room hold dear. It's what reproduces well. It's what's efficient. Well, it's what reproduces well. It's not always efficient. Yes. Dar Darwin is full of surprises. There are all kinds of weird, unintuitive yeah, well, things really that, that happen. Right but at the end of the day, Darwinian. it's what reproduces well. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this is one of my uh, current projects, is to try to figure out how to get 
reason to reproduce better because it, right now it's not. <laughs> so this is one of the one of the problems with with, with reason is that in in some in some ways it's self defeating because it leads you to come up with with ideas that are absolutely disastrous at least for your for your your reproductive fitness of your DNA, like this idea that it's okay not to have children. You know, that's a catastrophe for your DNA. I'm um. single. <laughs> 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 there you go. <laughs> I mean, the German, they don't produce so, so any more children. That's right. So, and, and, yes, and uh, I think life is going to be fine without children. I don't have children, but, you know, I'm enjoying my life. Oh, yes, your individual life can be perfectly fine. But it means that 100 years from now, there are going to be a lot more people in the world who are not like you. Because the people who are not like you reproduced and you didn't. That's not necessarily correct. <laughs> not necessarily, but no, you know, first it's, order approximation. It's that's, correct. that's directly applicable to your own personal genes that you might support people with similar values as you have children and, per, and get those populations to grow. Yes. But I don't see a lot of kids here. I mean, this, no, is, this, is, this is for uh, education. You, <laughs> you take all the, the, you know, the stupid people's children, you put them in a school, and you teach them how to be smarter than their parents. See, this is, I think it's a serious mistake to think of people who are unlike us as the stupid people. As long as you keep doing it, it doesn't and, matter. And, and that's... But then you're president, so you're <laughs> I have a question. So at what point do we, because we can all, I think, agree that, well, maybe we can all agree, but I feel that, I feel that, uh, morality is really subjective, and it really is depending on a lot of factors and a lot of cultures. And, you know, it really depends, right? So, at what it's, point do you, at what point do you say, because we're always evolving it, right? It's, it's, it's subjective, evolving. but it's not arbitrary. That's the point. Right. Okay. But but if if it if it's if it's based on reproductive uh, fitness fitness, then how would something say like agreeing that homosexuality is not evil? How does that translate into reproductive? Be because homosexuals can contribute to society in many ways, including, by the way, raising children. Right. This is one of the things that drives me crazy about raising them better the, than the gay them. debate. Yes. Yes. Because yes. the reason that marriage was invented had not, has nothing to do with making babies. Right. It has to do with raising them. Right. You know, the making, making the babies is the easy part. <laughs> it's the raising them that's the tough part that requires the commitment. Right. And gay people can do that just as well, if not better, than straight people. Then how about say like the, the head? Well, you said the head covering is more of a social, uh, political it's more thing. More social and political. But but, but we but when we look at it and think, oh, that's terrible. What is what is that? What do you, what do you suppose well, that like, is? I have to tell you, like a child when they grow up, you know, as some a child, you know, being completely naked all their life, they get used to it. Right. And those are or grow up since they were three or two, they had a cover their hair, and they grow up like that. Right. They, they, it, it is part of the daily life, right. you know? And that's why it's a, it's a cultural, it's nothing to do with the religion.